when it comes to support groups, I just think the the array of what we can do is so big. And, um, you know, I just think your presence is important and you are important. And I thought that it would be a great opportunity to have some conversation around support groups. People have been asking about it and we're gonna have some conversation definitely uh, about the struggles and the strengths and um, the beauty of all of it. So um, again, I'm Deidre Boylan and I will toss it off to Sarah to introduce herself. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah. I use she, her pronouns. I am our housing stability coordinator over here at the coalition. Um, I've only been here about four months, though. I just hopped on over from LifeWire. So what's up to my LifeWire folks that joined in today? Um, previously over there, I was the homelessness services manager. So working out of our transitional emergency shelters and uh, our rental assistance programming. So really, really excited to be here with y'all today and just go over all of these little ins and outs of support groups and just do all of this information sharing and so happy to be here with y'all. So I will pass it over to Heather. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Heather Ware. If you haven't um, encountered me yet, I am the legal advocacy program coordinator at Wiscative, but I also do a lot of other survivor-centered advocacy-related trainings, just like support group that we're doing today. Um, I loved doing support groups in my time as an advocate. I have even thought about, you know, like what are ways that I could, you know, be involved with the support group even now because I loved it so much. So I've done support groups at um, an LGBTQ specific support groups um, for sexual assault survivors. Um, I've done the general sexual assault support group, DV support group, and DV support group in Spanish. Um, so that's the, the experience I bring. Oh, and a support group in a, a jail facility. So um, happy to talk to any of you more about any of those specific things if we don't touch on them today, but really excited to be here with you all. And um, yeah, talk about something that's really the core of um, how domestic violence work started. Yeah, I think you're right. It's, I think, you know, as, as most of you um, submitted when you registered, you talked a little bit about what you knew and how long you've been doing support groups. And it was really interesting to hear just like what people are doing and what materials you're using or not using, or you just started and, you know, within week two, you were doing a support group and you had no idea what you were doing. So there's like this vast like um, skill set. Some people have been doing it for years and some people are just learning and just starting. So it was a huge gap between all of that. I mean, we had, I think 152 people register for this, for this training. So um, we know all folks can't be here today, but we're gonna record it. So definitely people can use it later. Um, we're just really excited to have the conversation because what you'll probably hear is that you're not alone in what you're thinking. You're not alone in what you're feeling. And um, some people still have binders and some people have stuff on the internet. So <laughs> some people have paper sta stapled together and you know in a package um, and it varies who has what, where, when, and how. So I think we'll kind of cover a little bit of that today. Yeah, All so right. I wanted to start out with a poll um, to get an idea of how much experience folks in the room have with facilitating support groups. Uh, uh, about a third of us haven't done a support group yet, a quarter of us just a few months, and everyone else is pretty evenly spread between a year, two to three years, and and there's a chunk here that have been doing it for so many years. That's really cool. So yeah, as Deidre said, we are across the board in experience levels and mm -hmm. very excited for a little later on, we'll maybe do some, some information sharing across the group. So cool, I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah, and remember folks, like what you see here, these are all your peers, right? These are the folks who are doing the support groups. So just getting the information that we're sharing is, it's. It's really interesting to see where everyone is at. So we, we, what we're hoping for is that one, you don't feel alone in doing this. Two, if it feels difficult, sometimes it probably is. Three, you're probably doing it right, whether you think you're doing it right or not. And four, you're not gonna screw anyone up by just listening, right? So just remember, like, as we keep going through this, 
all these folks on this call, we're all here with you and we're here to support each other. So keep an eye out, look at people's names, look at where people are located and um, just make sure you can even put your, your area of Washington where you're at next to your name so people can know. So you can partner up and support each other in your areas, right? We don't want you to be isolated in your community um, knowing that someone right down the road, you guys could be putting your heads together to come up with ideas for support groups. Yes. So our agenda really covers like, um, we talked about like what we wanted to discuss today and there's so much, but this is what we've narrowed it down to so far. So demystifying support groups, we just wanna take the mystery out of it. There's no, there is no mystery, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Starting a group considerations and must haves. Um, virtual support groups. We know some of you are still doing virtual support groups. We know folks have been doing them in person. Even some people have never stopped doing them in person. So, you know, that's a testimony right there. Um, common curriculum topics and resources, facilitation skills. I had none. Uh, and support group facilitations share out. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Heather or Sarah, anything? Um, no, just that, you know, these are, this is what we're going to move through today. And we do have a lot of um, times when we want to check in to hear from you all. Um, one of the big things that we wanted to do with some of the questions we asked in registration and in this webinar is to share what other people are doing um, and, you know, share resources and really support each other in doing support group. Um, and so we have a lot of spaces where we'd love to hear from you. And that's also part of why we're in the meeting format. Um, so just if you wanna um, think about what you do in your group and what works well and what doesn't as we're going through this, we'd you know, love to hear, hear some of that. So this slide right here, um, I, I wanted folks to, I think we asked a question on the, on the, on the registration um, or we had some question, but we pulled out of here, like what were the common things that people were thinking about and talking about? And this right here came from all of you. Um, and I thought it would be cool to do a word doodle just to, so that you could see what your peers are having conversations about or thinking about what's popping up for them. Um, obviously community participants, people, connections, support, experience, like some things are just very common. Um, I thought it would be great for everyone to see that because again, everyone on this call, you're, you're all connected because you're doing a thing that's very similar um, and we don't want you to feel alone while you're doing it. We want you to know that other people are having the same feelings, other people are doing this, this same work that you're doing and sometimes are perplexed by it or challenged by it. But we wanna make it so that you don't necessarily feel that way. We want you to know that there's other people who will support you in this work. You don't have to do it alone. Um, so here are some words that we just thought represented um, how people were feeling or thinking about and connected to. Uh, and we just wanted to put it in a word doodle. Any Anything else? Yeah, this is um, what people like the most about facilitating support groups. So um, some of those answers were longer and I was um, trying to make shorten them up so that um, <clears throat> we could see, you know, the bigger words or the things that were mentioned more frequently. Um, but there was just so much about sharing stories and community building and seeing survivors support each other. Um, and, you know, saying that in different ways people having aha moments, um, all that good stuff about support group. I think this would be a great um, thing to frame and put up during your support groups for um, not only you, but for your participants to see. I just like it. I think it's a great, great affirmation. Sarah, any thoughts? I just, one thing I always appreciate myself about support groups is that piece of community. And it was just so, so nice to see it multiple times in this wordle because it is such a huge part of support group and creating community for so many folks who experience all of that isolation and everything. So 
-hmm. that's the only thing I would add is just I also identify with many of these things that popped up for so many of y'all and if you have any thoughts make sure you put it in the chat feel free so what we heard from you um let's see is there a certification pro process um ways to engage in virtual support group how to facilitate a discussion, how to redirect, increasing youth engagement. I love these. Um, what curriculums are other people using? Great question. How to start a curriculum? Great. One support group uh, with multiple languages. I love that. Um, recruiting strategies and addressing conflict. I, I, I love all of these. I want, if we had time, I would like literally talk about everyone at length. <laughs> but we don't, but um, we are going to get to some of these. So um, this is what we heard from you. These are some of the questions and some of the things that you want to know about. And um, I think these are excellent. This is what everyone's thinking about. This is what people want to know. And I think we're going to just try to break this down and um, help answer some of these questions. And I also see in the chat, um, hearing solutions around provision of childcare, which we will touch on just a bit briefly. So I'm gonna write that down to make sure we talk about that as well. Yeah, so I, you know, there were a ton of questions. A lot of them were asking about the same thing. Um, so if we don't get to your question today, please do reach out to ask that, or we'll have some different times at which you can can ask it as well, um, because there's a ton of people here, not just D, Sarah, and I, um, who might have some good answers or, or good places to start with your questions. So demystifying the process. Um, first of all, love the flowers and the picture. Heather, you did a great job. <laughs> uh, advocates are often asked to lead support groups with no training or curriculum. This happens all the time. Um, we do know that um, Advocates are super resourceful, but it is challenging when you show up and you're expected to do particular things and you don't actually have like the, the, the information to do it and you're starting from scratch. Um, and again, that's why I said we're all on this call together. So your peers are right here with you. And these are the folks who are also doing it. As we saw in the poll, there are people who have been doing it for several years. Um, and we definitely want to hear from them and get their expertise and get their knowledge. But also to like just know that oftentimes we start from scratch, whatever we do, and there's no shame in that. There's nothing wrong with that. And sometimes it's actually pretty exciting when you decide, okay, I'm going to put together, you know, this curriculum and I'm going to do it myself and I'm going to do all my research and you build it yourself. So sometimes that there's actually some fun and excitement in that. So there's nothing wrong with it and there's nothing we do realize that sometimes we start our jobs and we start our positions and they're like, here you are go for it. This is what you need to do. I'm pretty sure we can all just raise our hand right now and say, yes, that happened to me. Because I, as a manager of a shelter, have been there before when the turnover is high and someone starts and you're like, you're on. And then, and then the manager's out the door, right? So, um, so sometimes we are put in those positions, but as we know, there are, uh, there are ways to get information. Um, so uh, you are not alone. You're not, you're not missing anything. Like definitely this feeling that you have, it, we've all felt it. It's not just with support groups too. It's also just figuring out how to do a one-on-one -on -one sometimes or a screening and intake um, or meeting someone for the first time when they show up and literally they're intoxicated and you're trying to figure out how to do this intake, right? So it's happened to all of us. Sometimes we just work on the fly. And I think some, that's why we took this job. We are people, people. We care about people. Um, we want to support and help people. And it is in our nature to be great listeners and supporters of those who need our service. There, there's not one perfect way that works. Obviously, we all know that because um, we're all spread out across Washington state. And if anyone's on this call that's not in Washington and maybe from a different state, we appreciate that you're here. But as we know, um, there isn't, there isn't like this perfect method to this process. It is definitely what you think, it, 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 as you listen to what people are talking about week by week, and you're really getting a vibe of what people need, you, that's where you go. I remember one time we did a support group where 
we had no idea what the topic was going to be. And we purchased um, slippers, flip flops, and we bought jewels and we bought glue guns and we put diamonds on flip flops while we talked. Right. So it was just a love those flip flops, by the way. But um, we just talked. And actually what it was was we were keeping our hands going while the conversation was going. Right. So that actually worked out well. So sometimes there isn't a plan, there isn't a curriculum, there isn't a one pager. It's just kind of the vibe of the process and what's happening at the time, making sure that you're supporting the people in the room and everyone has an opportunity to be heard. At that point, I'll just say, Heather, Sarah, any anything you wanna say? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say that with this, um, you know, we get a lot of questions about like, you know, what, what is the curriculum or, you know, I must be missing something. I'm not doing this right. And I just really wanted to emphasize that like the skills that you need for this are really advocacy skills and some group facilitation skills, of course, which we're going to talk about. Um, but that there's not, you know, a secret or something that you haven't learned or you're not being trained on. Um, and we really want to highlight that you have a lot of what you need and that you can learn on the job in this. Um, and it's not, you know, this is not like a professionalized role that you need like um, a certification to, to do this a group. I think we will wrap that up very beautifully and I don't have anything else to add. Um, in, and, you know, in that vein, and I think to like really hit home this point is like, what, let's think about like, what do survivors love about group? And <clears throat> what we hear and what we know from doing group ourselves is that people really like being able to tell their story and be heard, connect with others and build that community. Um, like we, we mentioned earlier, and getting support from others. Um, and I just also wanted to bring us back to the origins of support group, which is like groups of, um, you know, mostly women at the time in, in the early time of the movement coming together, like often in people's homes um, and just talking about their experiences with, of violence of sexism, things like that. Um, and all of that was peer-based. There wasn't a teacher or somebody who, um, you know, was on another level from them imparting knowledge. Like this was people talking about their own experiences, hearing from other people and thinking, oh, wow, you know, I actually went through something like that that didn't feel good, but I didn't realize it was probably, you know, violence or, you know, this or that. And so really just wanting to emphasize like that is the core of support group. Like that is what people are going to walk away remembering. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily going to be um, that you had like this perfect lesson plan because that's not really what it's about. Yes, we want to have activities. Yes, we want to have things to talk about. Yes, we want to have things to do. Um, but like what people are going to remember is how it made them feel. And that's all this stuff. And if you have anything you want to chime in, please raise your hand, unmute, just say what you need to say or put in the chat. We know that you guys also have great experience and information and knowledge, and we want to hear from you too. I also think just survivors love to just be able to come together and know that they're not alone in this, in this journey. Um, that others are having some of the similar experiences. And, you know, it's, it's always that feeling when you're in a room with someone and you're like, you're going, yeah, yeah, you know, and you don't feel alone anymore. Um, and that there's actually space and time for someone to hear you out, right? Like it's, there's nothing like sharing a personal story and then being cut off. I mean, I feel like that when I go to the doctor, right? You go to the doctor, you make the appointment and they're like, you're in and out in like eight minutes, right? So if you don't have a list of everything you want to talk about, like you can forget it because you're in and out, out the door. And sometimes you wonder, are they actually even listening to you? So I feel like support group is a great place where we carve out time to actually give time 
to folks to be able to share that, share that experience or share what they're going through. And we have the time to actually listen and they feel supported. We also do that in, in our one-on-ones with folks too. Go ahead, Sarah. I was just gonna add on to that, um, that piece of getting that support from their peers is, I always think it, there's so much more power to it when thinking about the power dynamics that inherently exist between us as advocates and working with our survivors. And, you know, of course we're going to listen to them and validate them and support, you know, their experience. And there's something that's just in a different way, so powerful to have that validation and support from someone who is not an advocate, who it's not their job to be providing you that support. They're just another person in the same room hearing a story of yours and saying like, yes, that it's real, like I'm here with you. And watching that happen as a facilitator is, was always like one of my favorite things when facilitating groups is just seeing that that solidarity and connection between survivors in the group itself and watching that community space transform and, and grow over the weeks. So things we already know you're good at, and you already know you're good at some of this stuff too. So just listening, like listening is huge part of this process, a huge part of this work. Um, and I think, you know, we're all great listeners. We, we have that ear that kind of just chimes in to be able to not only hear what people are saying, but also pinpoint things that are important to them, things that we know that we can support them on and with, and then things that we know that we probably need to get some other help to support them with. So we're really good at listening and being able to just have that space provided where people can feel like they can um, share, open up, let down, let down their guard and be a little vulnerable with us. And we know that happens. And we want, we want make, to make sure that people feel like they can share with us in a way that it's going to stay with us and we're going to support them and help them. And I think all of us do that so well. That's why you were hired for this job. This is what you do. Um, supporting people where, when they're overwhelmed, a lot of people come to us um, when they're in crisis. And so, um, you know, what that feels like for them to walk into a place and have someone just actually say, I've got time, you know, let's sit down. Let's let, let me listen to you. Like that's so key to someone's uh, decision making process to helping them feel like they're not losing their mind and someone's listening to them and they can actually just spill their guts out to them. I think it's so important that that's why, that's why we do this work. Um, providing resources, uh, you know, I always felt like the resources will come as we get to, as people continue to share. I think all of you know that when participants come to our program or, or um, uh, when anyone comes to our program, um, oftentimes we hear what they're saying in the beginning and then we set an appointment, they come back and we hear even more. And then we have a third appointment and we hear even more. And so what we realize and recognize is that the first appointment, we only just got a small piece of what was going on in that window. And there's so much more. So being able to provide resources actually comes over time because what people reveal to us comes over time. So we, we might not know what they really need until we meet with them after maybe one, two or three appointments at a time. Um, Heather and Sarah, you can jump in at any time. Well, I think that was, I think that was great. And, you know, we've been emphasizing a lot of this, um, just that, you know, what are the ways that you can bring these skills into the support group space? Uh, and when there's more than one person, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ray said the art on the slides is beautiful. Thank you for naming the artist as well. And I have to say, you are absolutely right, Ray. That is Heather, who is just amazing. And I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> And if the artist isn't named, it was like an open source image. That's like this one, but yeah. <laughs> so just thinking about just um, just responding in the moment, supporting people and um, just being there. I think having that open door opportunity for people to show up, um, I think is just says a lot to our community about how we're open and available to listen and take people where they are. Um, yes, someone has a question. Let's see. Trina? Um, yes. 
So um, my question is, what I'm trying to summarize it, like, yes, there is the act of listening, and there are times where I feel like I'm also enabling the survivor in a way. Um, like, is there a point in time where I can come in and provide them with something to move forward instead of keep being stuck in that space where they're constantly like bashing about the abuser like in a lot of our conversation? Like how do I best support so they don't like feel so stuck? If that makes sense. I don't know how to word it. <laughs> I can barely hear the question, but it sounds like you were saying, how can you support a survivor who is kind of stuck in a moment of, of bashing their partner? Yeah, like if they're like, if they're so stuck, like for such a long time and they keep going back about the same issue over and over and over, um, how do I, support that because yes like i know how to listen and just to give them that space um, but when is it appropriate to you know give some guidance or suggestion without sounding like i'm trying to fix their problem can you hear me good? yeah i can hear you i i mean i i have some thoughts but i also want to open it up and see if other people have some thoughts or if you want us to answer, that's fine too. But just just want to put it out there if anyone else has thoughts too. Yes, Beth. Um, this this happens uh, both in my one-on-one -on -one advocacy and it, and it does happen sometimes in group. So I can address it in group. We work with a set curriculum and now we're doing groups online on Zoom. So we have a slide deck, um, sometimes videos, but say there's like 30 slides to the slide deck. You know, I'll listen, we'll acknowledge, we'll acknowledge the challenges, but then I'll use the slide deck to keep moving forward with the subject for that week and to facilitate deeper conversation around the topic we're working with, but also at the same time, acknowledging the challenge and difficulty and emotional hurt that causes, you know, this sort of rumination about the abuser. And then in one-on-one -on -one advocacy, I try to support and acknowledge the hurt, but try to focus the conversation on the survivor and try to, listen for outcome, for change talk in the survivor or for stated outcomes that they'd like to see and then support them in that direction. And sometimes I will simply just say, let's focus on you while we're here together. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Beth. Yes. Anyone else? Um, I was just gonna, hi, I'm Katie, she, her, and I'm with YWCA Pierce County, same with Beth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking that sometimes it's helpful just to name the feelings that they're expressing and maybe not necessarily the subject. And so then, you know, if they're expressing like this person caused me to, you know, hurt I, this person hurt me in this way, then you would kind of help them name the feeling and then say, what would help you, you know, feel better or heal from that feeling. And so we're acknowledging where they're at right now and also trying to help them move forward and naming what they need to heal from, you know, the negative experience that they had. Obviously it's not going to happen overnight or maybe, you know, in a week or two, sometimes that takes years, but just kind of helping them acknowledge the narrative that they have and maybe shift from what happened to what I would like to happen or where they're going change talk, basically like what uh, Beth said, but. Yes, thank you. We've got some, some shared ideas in the, in the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Heather. 
Yeah, I was just putting um, things that you all had shared in, in your answers. Um, I really liked those. I think that um, asking questions about how they felt, that's a great idea um, to have them share more about, you know, what they were actually feeling when, or why it is that they want to keep talking about this thing that another person did. I want to give um, Amy, you wanted to share something? Uh, sure. Hi. So um, in my support group right now, um, we open each session with acknowledging three things that, uh, three emotions and three feelings mm -hmm. and um, what we're struggling with currently and something we're proud of to set the mood for each person. So we know going forward what we're looking for as, um, as facilitators. Um, so uh, I'm a facilitator and then I have, I'm an intern that helps kind of keep background notes going and pick up on other things I don't. And um, we try to find resources together um, as we're working through things. And then we try to wrap it back into, oh, I remember you mentioned that and talk about it in a frame of getting connected to resources and what have you done about this so far? Um, and um, have you connected to people? Um, and I do a lot of what Katie mentioned of really naming that emotion and how that emotion can also be helpful in progress. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I do that. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Also to keep in mind that everyone's pace is different. Um, you know, just someone might be in the space where they just have to keep talking about their partner for a while until they can get past it. I mean, sometimes people are just in shock of the behavior of their partner and can't understand why this person behaves that way and just needs that time to process it. Um, maybe uh, the one-on-ones are better for that person during that time instead of being in a support group. Um, but also to know that sometimes people just need to be in that space and their process time looks different from other people's process time. Um, and that's okay. Like it's, it's, it's fine. Um, and you can point out, you know, always at the end, I've always learned that at the end of a one-on-one -on -one or at the end of something, I like to wrap up and say, I want to share back with you a little bit of what I've heard today. Um, and then sharing back with that person, what you heard reiterates what you kind of talked about. So if every time you're having the conversation and this person is saying the same thing, they're going to start to hear that they're saying the same thing each time. So you can use that as a tool to say, I've noticed in the last several sessions, you know, these are the things that we've you've talked about. Are there other things that you also would like to talk about? So just using those skills to just figure out ways to engage with your participant. I see Katie has her hand raised. We were talking that just made me think of something. Um, Sometimes it's also about, um, not necessarily about their partner at all, but trying to rationalize irrational behavior and like the reason why it happened to us or um, here at the Y, we specifically serve um, survivors of intimate partner violence. So a lot of times it would be like, I loved this person so much and I showed them in so many ways. So, you know, wh what is the reason or how can I, make sense of why they did this to me. And so it really has nothing to do with the partner, but more of um, like like trying to understand how that person didn't didn't value them or, you know, so just maybe thinking like the the partner is a as an avenue, but it's much deeper than just what that person did. Sometimes helps me to um, like Deandra said, just kind of let them be in the space that they're at and support them, just knowing that, it's, you know, you got to kind of work through it on your own in whatever way that comes up for you. Thank you, Katie. And there's some um, other thoughts in the chat. So please feel free to read that. And Jenna put a, a link in there if people are interested in a podcast. Have yeah, and I do. I love all of these answers so much. And what Dee was saying, just to add on to what Dee was saying at the end there, um, you know, I think that you can come back to someone and be like, hey, so the past few sessions, like, you know, you've been, uh, let's say they start off this next session kind of doing the same thing. You can share back what you've observed and be like, hey, you've talked a lot about, um, <laughs> and you've talked a lot about, um, you know, 
what your partner's been doing. And, and when we started meeting together, I heard that you were also really interested in talking about, you know, maybe getting connected to therapy or you were thinking about how you wanted to, whatever they said they wanted to do for themselves. Um, <clears throat> is there a way that you could bring it back to something else that they've shared about themselves that they wanted or wanted to work on? Um, and, you know, you can be direct like that. And then the last thing I just wanted to add is this sort of question about enabling in some form comes up a lot in different trainings that I do. And I just wanted to share that. I don't really believe that that is something that we can do as advocates and just listening to someone's story. Like they are on their own healing path and you're not doing any harm by listening to that person share. Granted, would it be cool to be part of like them making change? Yes. And I want you to be invested in that. And that is great. But it's also not like a failure if that person is like coming and talking it through because like Kate shared, like there could be a bunch of different reasons that's happening. They're trying to make sense of the situation that doesn't make sense. They're trying to, you know, figure out like, is all this stuff that happened to me, is that actually a good enough reason to leave this person? Maybe, maybe it's not. Um, and also like a survivor is a whole person in the world that like was a person before the violence happened to them and came to you. They might be someone who's not particularly great at looking at themselves or their own behavior for like any number of reasons, right? So there's just like a lot going on there. Um, and I loved all the different angles you all shared to think about that. Um, and so I would just say, don't, don't push pressure on yourself to um, have to like completely have it figured out, try different things. And, you know, you're helpful, but you're not, you're not enabling anybody. That's, that's, that's my opinion. And I think and I really Magdalena in the chat had a really great point that goes along with that of just not putting a timeline on people's mm -hmm. healings and not having that your own self-individualized expectation of what you would like to see with your survivors as much as we have all of, as Heather said, we have hopes for them and because we are rooting for them and we want them to do, you know, achieve all of the things that we know they can achieve, but that that's on their time. And, and that's really where we have to put in that piece of, you know, that survivor driven advocacy into these facilitation roles. I always say we are them, they are us. It's just, it, it, it is what it is, right? And, um, you know, I mean, we've all experienced that time when something happened to us that we were like, oh, you know, whether that person cut you off on the freeway and flipped you off or whether someone cut you in line or whatever the case may be. And you were just so in shock about it that you called someone and you told them, do you remember when you told the story and you're like, guess what happened to me? And you tell someone the story and then you tell someone else the story because you're still like, did that happen? And then you tell someone else and then you get to work and you tell two or three people. And then, then you're at the point where you're not like, did I tell you the story already? Because now you don't even remember how many times you told the story, right? So you're telling the story because you're trying to make sense of something that happened that you can't even make sense out of. And you're just telling it over and over until finally you get to the point where you're like, okay, I don't need to tell that story again, right? So it's it's such a shocker that, that you're trying to make sense of it. So I say we are them, they are us because it just unfolds in different ways, right? So, yeah, that's so true, Dee. I, I caught myself doing that many a times going through my phone. I'm like, I gotta tell someone else's story because I didn't get what I needed <laughs> <laughs> that last telling, yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay, so I'm seeing, um, if you have questions, feel free to add them in. We are seeing them. Um, we are just going to uh, address, if there are things that we already kind of have bookmarked to talk about, we'll talk about them when we, when we get to that. Um, so these are, I had to put in this image of the binders because as we were prepping, we all had stories of finding an old binder with really, old support group handouts that someone, a mix of things that people are still using and they used 20 years ago. And you're like, is this any good? Or if you're really new, you're like, is this exactly what I'm supposed to be doing? And then like, you probably learn over time that like, no, you don't have to, you don't have to do this exactly. If, if there's things in there you like, maybe you can use them or not. Um, but like, we all had stories about the old binders. So 
Well, I like that I used to determine whether it was good material or not, whether or not it had coffee stains on it. So if it was like a nice white crisp piece of paper, I assumed it was new information. But if it had stains on it, I was like, this has to be really old, right? So I had a whole theory of like what was great and what was not. This like I had to do research on the coffee stain pieces of paper. And we had so many binders, it was ridiculous. And most of the binders actually just were the, all the same thing. Like, oh my God, how many copies? We weren't handing them out. So why did we need 500 copies? of this thing, like it did, it made no sense to me. But I mean, I do not to bash binders because I do think like sometimes they are helpful. They can be a guide to us, but just remember like once the paper, once the information on the binder starts to tilt sideways, you might wanna retype the information. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna talk about um, considerations and that you might want to think through as you're starting a group and some must tabs like childcare and things that you all have been asking about. Uh, <clears throat> so we <clears throat> we talked about this a little bit earlier, but just wanted to name that DV support groups or sexual assault support groups that our advocacy programs are running are not necessarily the same as other types of support groups that are out there. There are support groups that are led <clears throat> by therapists, <clears throat> that have specific therapeutic interventions that the therapist is doing, that's not what we're doing. We might be borrowing from some of what that is in terms of like sharing some psychoeducational material and talking about it as a group, reflecting on things together. But our support groups are informal with lots of space for discussion and peer support. Um, and that doesn't mean that you can't bring materials, but I just wanted to, to emphasize that, you know, you're not trying to have a very specific outcome in, ther in terms of an intervention. And it's also not um, a class or a course. Sometimes people will refer to it as that. That's fine. Whatever people want to, you know, call the group that they're coming to. But I did just want to emphasize that, like, you know, people don't have to learn material. You're mostly bringing material as like a discussion facilitation and, you know, for people to have something to reflect on and learn from. That's not to say that they don't learn something from group, but just that, you know, it's different from a class in that there's a lot of space for people to talk about what they think and feel. Um, and that it's not mandatory. I know that um, a lot of our programs will get calls from people who are being told that they have to be in a group um, and there are ways that we can handle that. Um, but we as programs do not require people to attend our group, right? Like if someone needs documentation that they came, that's one thing and you can figure something out with that. But um, people should be coming to group on the, of their own accord and you know we're, we're not requiring them to come. Right, right. I mean, I think it's it's all voluntary. I mean, most of our, all of our services are voluntary. So when someone calls you and says, someone has to go to your group and you need to report back to me, you know, that is generally something that we do not do. We don't do. I mean, I, you know, it could look different in some of your programs, but that's just how it looks for us. Most of our programs. Sarah, were you gonna say something? Oh, I was just saying, yeah, that's a, it's a no for me. Um, <laughs> I think I always I have often seen that most come from like CPS workers who are demanding that their client is involved in some type of support group and they want to talk to you as the advocate to make sure that survivor is attending and what did they talk about and those are all of those things that I mean if your survivor wants you to do that report back and is pushing up for you as an advocate to do that that's a conversation you can have and you know also talking through with your programs, but overall across the board, you know, these are voluntary spaces. And the moment we make it that mandatory piece, then we lose that that survivor driven aspect of it. And it's no right. longer it it takes away that that safety of what the group and the space is supposed to be intended for. Correct. Yeah. And you know, we are definitely gonna get people reaching out who don't understand that. And so, you know, I know I've had that conversation with um, CPS before 
Um, and, you know, people reaching out and saying, they told me I have to take a DB class and then kind of trying to talk to that person and understand, like, were they talking about support group? Were they talking about um, batter's intervention? Most of those folks that I've talked to, they were talking about support group, but as if there's like a DB class that you can force survivors to take so they like don't experience DB anymore or something awful. So, you know, we have to be curious when people are reaching out about that and it might it might be that like support group is a good fit for that person, regardless of what they're being required to do. Um, but just sort of wading through that and explaining how we think about support group is, is important. Yeah, and I see Rocio put down that DSHS sends people to support groups. And a lot of times people will do that. They'll, it'll be part of their parenting plan where they have to take classes or go to support groups and things like that. And I think, um, you know, if you, if you talk to folks and let them know like, Sure, we can give you attendance. Like if that person, if that person wants it, if the participant wants us to write down that yes, you attended a group today, that's fine. But not giving out like details of what you talked about, not giving out detail, you don't have to give handouts. It's just, you know, yes, this person attended. Um, but also making sure that that your participant know what knows what that means. So like if they do come and you say yes, you were here on this day, but then they missed two or three. Like, I want them to also know how that can have an impact on their, what, whoever they're reporting to. And um, so that conversation really has to start at the beginning before you start signing their attendance sheets papers so that they know what, what they're getting into if, they, if they're not attending the support group. And there's nothing wrong with really doing an attendance because sometimes people have to have, unfortunately, our system puts that in the way of folks really being a, a parent um, and wants them to do that. So if the least we can do is an attendance sheet, that's great, but we shouldn't be giving out like, this is what she said, this is what we talked about, so on and so forth. Okay, things to consider. Um, and Heather, jump into, I think you're gonna say something, so go ahead. Oh yeah, these are just some different pieces that you would wanna think through as you're starting a group. And if you already have a group going, uh, you know, I think these can still be things to reevaluate, especially if you're a new advocate who's starting and you wanna do things a little bit differently or at least, you know, thoughtfully um, that you, you chose to do it this way. So, um, you know, you can have closed or open groups. So a completely open group would just be like anybody, comes any week, any time, that it's still an open group if they're referred by their advocate. Um, but we're just thinking of like open is one that it's not the same group of people for X amount of time. A closed group would be like, you know, the same group of people for 12 weeks and nobody new starts until, you know, that, that check-in point. That's like the new sort of the opening of the group for um, it to it just start again. Um, and both of these are valid. I think that there are definitely advantages to having a closed group of folks in terms of building rapport um, and trust. And it also can be a way to like, that could be like if you're going through your curriculum um, that you're going with those through it for that 12 weeks or whatever it is, I'm just saying 12 weeks, but could mm -hmm. really any amount of time. Mm -hmm. Right. Recruiting for groups. How will you get the word out and invite people to come? I'm curious to know how folks um, invite people to their support groups. You could put it in the chat. I know when I was when I was at New Beginnings, we just like, you know, anytime everyone had a caseload and, and anyone on those caseloads were open to come to the support group. So they were very open um, to people who wanted to show up. Um, and having enough space for that. So, you know, we were a pretty big organization. So we had a lot of clients in our, in our program and making sure that we had enough support groups each night of the week that actually could cover uh, the number of people we were serving. So sometimes we would have two in one night and they would be in two different rooms. So just figuring out how to meet the needs of the volume of people you have and the volume of folks that you're inviting to the support group. And I also know that some folks now probably are doing it virtual and I don't know how many people are showing up to the virtual groups. Um, and if you have any questions about that, please go ahead and put in the chat or raise your hand, whichever one works. Um, 
screenings and ongoing check-ins, I think, um, and Heather and Sarah, you can jump in too. I think, you know, the important thing about um, folks coming to our organizations, our programs to, to get resources or information or talk to us is like just ongoing check-ins. Like just because they're going to a support group doesn't mean they don't want to do a check-in with you. Like check in with folks. Sometimes people will go to support group and talk a lot about things, but the things that they're most vulnerable about, they save to just meet with an advocate for, right? So um, remember a support group doesn't always fit the need for every individual that's coming to the support group. They do want to spend that one-on-one -on -one time with you um, to check in about some other things that they might not reveal during the support group. Yeah, and with the screening, you know, that can be that can be a range of things. It's not necessarily a hard, you know, screen in, screen out process, but it's a good time to talk about what the expectations are from group, um, what that's going to look like, you know, confidentiality, things like that. Um, I have done a support group that had like basically no screening. And then I've also done a support group where, you know, the screening was what, what I would consider to be pretty, um, pretty intensive. And that was for the um, sexual assault support group that I did with LGBTQ survivors. Um, and the reason for that was that that group um, was a peer support group and it had a lot of skill building in it. And so we had conversations with folks to see if they were in a place to open up that trauma and really take a look at it and do skill building because if it was going to send them into a deep amount of crisis and they didn't have like a therapist or other support people in their life or other stability in their life, we just didn't feel like that was a great fit. And those folks were more than welcome to do one-on-one -on -one advocacy. Um, but in, in that case, we just weren't screening those folks into group. And I'm not saying that's the right or wrong thing to do. I think it's just a choice, right? So like, if there's a specific thing that you're looking to try and you want there to be that more in-depth conversation, that's okay. It just needs to be really spelled out and, you know, what, what you're going to offer the people who maybe aren't a good fit for that particular group. Um, and then another, um, the reason we had ongoing check-ins also was because, um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, so I won't go into it too much now. But, you know, you can talk about when support group might, like, might be a good fit and might not be a good fit. And you can just lay out also, like, we're going to check in every, you know, I don't know, once a quarter about how it's going. And if you feel like, you know, you might be ready to move on or if it's feeling like a good fit and that way you can kind of build in a natural time to talk to people about that. And we say that just um, because, you know, some of the issues that do come up in support group um, of folks like perhaps wanting to stick around for a very, very long time, like years upon years. And, you know, maybe someone actually isn't a really good fit because they're a really huge monologuer and they like don't take feedback, you know, just like, is there a point? I'm not saying that it's like that person's out, but I'm saying like, can you set the expectation that we're going to be talk, checking in um, about it? And that way it's not a surprise and it's happening for everyone, right? Like it's not, you know, and I'm not saying this has to be an evaluation. I know all my examples have been of like problems, but like, you know, just, just setting it out there, like, Hey, we're going to check in about how it's going and a check-in for some people might be like, how's work group going? And they're like, I love it. And you're like, great, wonderful. Um, but you yeah. know, just having that space. Yes. Yeah. Share, share about what to expect from support group intake. I, I am an, I am, so, I'm so, uh, into, uh, when you do an intake with someone, that you actually take the time to talk about your program. This is an opportunity. You know, people, people come to our programs because they're in, in, in a situation where they want to understand what's happening in their life. Um, and they're not actually asking you like, how many staff do you have? What are your hours? What else do you provide? Like, they're not thinking about asking you those questions. So sometimes when folks come to do an intake and you lay the groundwork about who you are as an organization and what you do and how many staff you have so that they can get a sense of who all these people walking past your door or who are the people in the lobby when I walked in. Like share the information about who you are, who your organization is to, to folks so that they can really understand what they're walking into. So when you talk about 
support groups, lay it out. Just say, we have so many support groups a week. S certain advocates do support groups. You, we have a children's group, blah, 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 blah. You want to share this information so they have all the information um, that they need to, so that they can make the best decision for them. So I, I think intakes and intakes don't always happen at the very beginning. So it might not happen at the first time that you meet with that person, or it could, or it might lap over into the next conversation. So sometimes you don't get through the whole intake process. You do it on the next time over. So um, that process can take some time, but I think making sure that your participant is fully equipped to know what your program, your organization is offering so that they can make the best decisions for them. Uh, that's something that I think about when we talk about intake. It's like, it's not just that you're getting information, you should be giving information as well. Sarah or Heather, were you gonna say anything? Didn't mean to. Not about that piece. Um, I just know that we had a couple other things the things that we wanted to touch on at the end here. I think um, you might have had some thoughts on that, Sarah, from, from being uh, working mm -hmm. in some housing programs. But, um, you know, community groups where people don't have, most people don't have other relationships with each other, which is not always the case, right? Um, they, they might know each other from other spaces, but groups in shelter with folks who are living in shelter together, there's a, um, a different, you know, that can present other challenges or dynamics. Um. Yeah, there's always things to think about when you're running a group in shelter, especially just with the structure of what program it is that your shelter runs through. If it's a 90 day stay shelter and you guys have to be really strict on that 90 days and you're gonna have folks coming in and out of your group as they naturally move in and out of shelter. So thinking about that might be a group space that you really keep as an open format and really focusing on just that piece of peer support and pairing that up with the one-on-one -on -one advocacy that's also happening within that shelter program. Or if it's a communal living shelter and you're a transitional housing facility and folks are there for actually a longer amount of time, those are spaces where you can really think about those more you know, curriculum-based groups or having a closed group space that is set with a bit more intention because you know that folks are going to be able to just physically be in that space and being able to have that conversation too with your folks as you know maybe they're about to be moving out of that program and talking through what resources they might need if you know they built this community within the support group within the shelter so how do they still get that level of peer support when you know they're not going to be able to come back to the shelter because of confidentiality of that and all all of those pieces so how do we get them into maybe another support group that they can enter and have that same level of support or is there another resource that's going to be suitable for them after that time so just thinking about those pieces that come up when you're working specifically within like the confines of a housing program and the limitations that come within that yeah, I see that some folks have put some information in the chat. So they're, have, they're just writing about what they do in their programs. So please check that out. Um, and then I was just gonna say like, um, you know, we have childcare, childcare versus children's group. And one thing I just wanna point out is like uh, all agencies are, are kind of different. Um, and the agencies that do have childcare, those who have children's groups, they've kind of like mapped it out, figured it out, sat down, create a plan, put it in the budget. If you do not have these options, I think you kind of have to start from scratch and figure out how are we gonna provide childcare? How are we gonna provide a children's support group? What is that gonna look like? Who's gonna do it? What does it, what does it require? I think that is a discussion that has to happen within your organization first to make sure you have the staff to cover it, you have the finances to cover it. So it might need to go into the budget. So planning something like this, if you don't already have it, could take some time within your organization meeting with um, other staff and management to figure out how to, how to fold this new thing into your organization. It's not a good thing to just start a group. Um, I, I, we are scrappy people. We know how to do anything off of nothing. I know that about all of us because we just do it. 
So yes, you could start a support group easy, but I think that there's other things that come along with making sure that it flows, it's, it's smooth, everyone's getting what they need, um, and, and you as a facilitator are getting what you need. So making sure that it is part of the budget plan, it's a part of your organization's process, and making sure that you're getting the support you need to carry out this support group is a conversation that needs to happen, and sometimes that takes several months. And also too, if you want it in, in the budget, we all know that budgets are usually worked on between October, November, and December. So you want to make sure you have those conversations before the budgets are due so that it can get into the budget for the next year. So just really thinking about if you're doing a support group for children or if you want to do something for, for kids, um, making sure that you have also to the materials to do it. Um, and, um, and, and, and I want to say that it's not as complicated as it might seem. Um, if it seems complicated at all, but just, um, there are folks that you can even put it in the chat if you're doing a support group for kids right now, or if you're doing childcare, childcare is very different from a support group. Um, and it does require, um, I think some different skills, uh, for each, for each of those. So. And I would also add that piece of age limitations that that's something you can also talk through during that screening process of um, what is the age limit of if you are going to be allowing any children to attend the support group with the survivor. So maybe infants are okay to bring along or up to age two, but as we know, you know, kids are sponges and we don't want them to be taking in all of the, you know, trauma stories and things that come up in a space. So really talking through with your programs of what is that age limit that you are going to set, if any, and also for the children's groups that will coincide or childcare as well. Um, really talking through the ages, you know, we will provide childcare for, you know, toddlers through 13 or whatever it may be, because the needs of different child ages are just so different. And if you are going to have a group and talking through, maybe all of a sudden we have a group and 10 of the women have three-year-olds. That is going to be a lot more of a task for your staff to do childcare for than maybe a group of 10-year-olds in a room. So really thinking through who's attending that group, what are the age ranges of those children and how that's also going to affect maybe how many volunteers you might need, um, how many staff are going to be co-facilitating the coinciding group. And also just thinking about special needs, if kids have particular special needs or have sensory needs, um, um, those things are real important to think about when providing services to kids. Um, it's just a much more fragile situation because as we know, participants, they're, sometimes they share, but children are really reluctant to share to strangers. So just keep in mind that that pace can look very different and that space can feel very different based on kids, what they've seen, what they've experienced and how they react to other children that might be in, in their space. Heather? Yeah, I was just gonna add that, um, you know, the other option that we haven't explicitly named is that you can also just have um, like either with your flexible funding or maybe it's in the budget, you can pay for someone's childcare and not have to, you know, you can be like, we'll pay for two hours of childcare um, to a childcare provider um, and do it in that way. And, you know, the survivor has to figure out what that looks like, um, but you could, you could always do that. That's been um, something that has happened at organizations I've worked at either that or, you know, also paying someone, um, on site separately if it's not a staff person or, or a volunteer. Um, and then of course, you know, having to have a conversation with that person about whether or not doing this confidential childcare is a good fit for them and what that would really have to mean. Um, but I think that it, the question about virtual support group and childcare, I would think that that would likely be, um, fall more in the category of paying uh, for childcare, and, and you can figure out how much it is that you're able to offer each person and the amount of time that it is um, and, you know, planning for your, like DSET for your program to be able to, to offer that. I know that someone specifically had some questions about children and childcare groups. I, I hope we touched on it, but if not, put it in the chat so that we can make sure we're answering your questions the best, 
of our ability. So I know people were asking a little bit about children's groups. I, I someone put in the chat too um, about having groups simultaneously at the you know same time. The, the women's support group and then the children's support group doing it at the same time actually could work for folks. So and remember, age age plays a factor in a lot of times when we do children's support groups. So you know when you have infants and you have ten year olds. You know, just keeping in mind that sometimes all ages aren't meant to be together because just of the experience that some children have had. Um, so just thinking about and considering like what kids have experienced, witnessed, seen, been exposed to, um, and then being around other kids, um, just keeping that in mind. It, it takes a village to do childcare, I just want to say. <laughs> Right, right. And you might not be able to pay one person to do child care for a 10 year old and an, and an infant, right? That, that just might not, you know, might not be a good fit. <laughs> right. Um, oh, and I, I think you had some thoughts about this, Dee, but the other piece I wanted to make sure we touched on was managing groups held off site. So sometimes your support group may or may not be held at your program or a program space. Um, I know I've done support groups that were held off site. And so, um, you know, there's conversations about confidentiality to be had with attendees, but then there's also just factors that you can't control if you're in someone else's space. Oh yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if other people, you can raise your hand if you've done um, support groups off site. Um, and you've come against uh, up against like that or where you're doing the support group at might also have other support groups for other things. Um, we had a support group where um, we were providing a support group, but the person's abuser was also attending other support groups in the in the same building because they were running simultaneously. So we had issues around getting back and forth to the car, what time that person arrived, um, things like that. So just being aware of, especially when you're in a small community, like buildings are used for multiple multi-purpose reasons and, and, and resources. Um, and so you might be providing a support group in this building, but other things are happening where the partner might be showing up to do some support as well. So just thinking about like where you're having them, um, the resources that you have in those buildings, is it safe? Is it a place that um, folks feel safe in? Um, and just make, and, and again, we are required to make sure that there is safety, no matter where we're renting or locating our support groups, it is our responsibility to make sure that that location is a safe location for folks. And when I say safe, it's safe as we can, as we can possibly make it. So some of the must-haves that we've been mentioning, um, already having a childcare option of some sort. Um, also wanting to make sure that there's a backup person. Um, we were talking about this, um, you know, sometimes it's not possible, but really figuring out a way um, to, to have someone because you don't know what's gonna happen if things go sideways. And sometimes your groups are being held when like the whole office is closed, right? And there's no one else there with you. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, that's why I say like, when you're thinking about support groups right now, if you're thinking about like, I keep doing this support group, but something doesn't feel right. I'm going to ask you to press the pause button and really figure out what is making you uncomfortable or what's not working. Um, and then take that back to your staff, your coworkers, your, your management to say like, this is the thing that's really making me feel a little anxious. And I want to see if we can have some conversation about it. Um, you too have to be comfortable to be able to support other people who are not necessarily in a space to think about their safety, right? So it's important that you as well as the facilitator kind of have all your bells and whistles on in case there's an emergency that comes up. So thinking about, um, you know, oftentimes we had survivors had their partners picking them up after support group, you know, and it, it happens, right? So just being prepared for moments like that or, you know, a survivor had their partner show up to pick up the kid from the child care group, right? And we were like, oh, okay, you know. So people are just trying to figure out how their lives are going to work. And we also have to figure out not only safety for the folks who are coming to us, but our own safety and what that looks like. And so just running, running through your process, like, are there enough staff around? Um, is there anyone else on site 
that I can ask for help if something happens. Say someone has um, low blood sugar and they pass out and you're the only support group person there. Um, not only do you have to go get something to help this person, but you also have to call maybe 911. Who knows what might happen, but who's the backup person that's there with you, supporting you to be able to make sure that, you know, you've got that, you've got that backup too. So what does that look like? Making sure you're creating space for that. I could go on and on about that, but you all know what I mean. If you have questions, ask me. <laughs> I just think it's, we should also as advocates not be left alone to triage multiple things happening. And we know that that can happen from time to time. So just thinking about, I know we used to have a volunteer that helped out, but during COVID, a lot of that has changed. You don't have the volunteers you used to have. You don't have people, you know, showing up. You know, we used to have like a maintenance person that would walk around and I could rely on, but you know, those things don't, the, the, maybe those things don't exist anymore. So just thinking about the change, if you're gonna go back to doing support groups in person um, versus virtual, like what are you walking into? What do you need that's gonna set you up for success to be able to provide the support groups for folks where they're feeling safe and you're feeling safe as well. And safe is a relative word because we know crisis can happen, things can happen and we have no control over some things at all. Did you all have anything specific you wanted to say about the community agreements that you'd done in the past or ways to, to check in about those? I think the only thing I will would have to add on community agreements is I've found it really helpful, especially in those closed group spaces where you are having really intentional, more deep diving conversation around, you know, as a group talking through, like, what does this mean for us to have this as a safe space and letting the survivors really determine that for themselves. And that's also a time where you can talk through, you know, what types of language is okay in that group. And something that also inherently comes up is, you know, we have folks from all different walks of life and people come in with their own views on certain things. And it comes up where there will sometimes be racial harm that happens or, you know, homophobic remarks or sometimes, you know, a person talking about their experience being trafficked and they use street language that maybe is not the language that someone who feels a bit more empowered by their experience with sex work is and that can come up. Um, and so really talking through at the beginning of groups and that can also come through in your screening time as well. What those agreements are as a community and those expectations and talking through, you know, if someone does say something in group that they find maybe that doesn't sit so right with them. Is there a community like word that you guys wanna use on like, hey, I just wanna pause, can we unpack that? Or like, that doesn't sound great. And talking through how as a group, you guys are gonna decide like, yeah, when I'm feeling a type of way, this is what we as a group are agreeing that we'll talk about it. And, and we'll have this group expectation that like, it's okay and we'll, touch on it and come back and talk about it later. Or maybe there's a decision-making process of like, I just want it to be acknowledged and then I'll talk with the group facilitator one-on-one -on -one after. So really thinking through that as a group and that's something you can do in both closed and open groups. I find it really helpful, especially in those closed groups though, um, to just yeah have that intentionality at the beginning. And that just reminded me that I've also had the experience of um, being able to, you know, sometimes people don't bring it up in the minute, um, in the moment when something um, bothers them or it is harmful. Um, and so I discussed it with um, that person outside of group and we've kind of talked about what they would want to see change and if there is a way that they would want to initiate a conversation about a new group agreement or something like the next session. Um, and I've, I've had some good experiences of doing that, that um, the survivor has like felt good about wanting to, to come back around to it and share it with the group and kind of lead that conversation and um, it not being like accusatory or things like that. 
Um, and, you know, depending on what happens, that may or may not be the right fit, right? Um, but just kind of putting out there that there are some, some different options that we can model in terms of um, how we want to build a community space and, you know, things don't have to be ignored or swept under the rug, but like there are things we can do as facilitators to support. And then there are also conversations we can have with the group so that they're, they're building that group um, cohesion and, and safety. Also too, I just want <clears throat> to keep in mind that like, you know, we are who we are. We show up, we, we live in our environments that we're used to. And, you know, I, you know, people show up to support groups who they are. Um, we don't expect people to show up uh, representing our Western world of, of expectations and um, professionalism all the time. That's not the way people live. Some people are just scrappy and they have survival mode and, you know, every other word is the F word and that's who they are, right? So, um, when you get that person that comes in that support group, it's it's their mechanism of survival, right? That's what they know. That's what they've been doing. That's what they, that's the way they are because that's their survival mode. So asking someone to come to be in a support group and sort of change the way they are can be very uh, jolting to someone. So it's important to just remember that it's, it's a pace, um, it's a conversation. Um, definitely there's moments when you might say we want to keep, you know, the swearing to a, a minimum. Um, but remember people show up who they are and, and where they've been and what they've been doing. And to ask them to be someone else is very hard when they're also trying to process the trauma that they've been through. So just making sure you create space to have those conversations with folks, not in the middle of a, a group to call them out or embarrass them, but maybe at a separate time on a one-on-one -on -one to talk about, you know, language within a, within a group space um, and, and what can be harmful to others um, or maybe triggering to others. Maybe that's a better way to put it. But I just always think like, you know, we show up who we are and, and we can't change people and make them to be different, it's just who they are. And I wanna just also say that there's been some great comments in the chat from Magdalena, Ray, um, and I, I wanna say this right, Kanoya, I hope I said that right, um, um, and Amy, who's put wonderful things in the chat. So if you have not checked them out, Katie put some things in there, please read um, folks information in the chat. Uh, box. Oh, we have ooch, oops, ouch moments in teen groups. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to move a little bit more quickly through the next few slides because I want to make sure that we get to talking into curriculum and facilitation. Um, and we've talked about this a little, so we've talked about this a little bit already. Just wanted to say that you need to have a conversation with your team to decide what this is gonna look like for your program or any specific group. It would look different for different kinds of groups. Um, but we just know that this question comes up if the support groups are just sort of for anyone or if we're looking for um, just certain groups have, have certain requirements or have certain you know people um, who they're serving. And so this is sort of what I mentioned earlier about that group that I did that had the more intensive um, screening for whether um, people like had the stability in their life to, to dive into some of that skill building. Um, so just want to put this out there that this is something to, to think about for your program and the groups that you're running. Um, and the answer might be that it is totally open to everyone. Um, just wanted to put some um, intention behind that. Also, too, we talk about confidentiality and, you know, as you have um, are new to your organization or are not new to your organization, we really have an understanding of what confidentiality means. Um, and, and if you're not a part of the organization, you're a participant, that word doesn't have the same necessarily meaning to you. So when people show up and you're talking about, you know, confidentiality, they hear you, but also, too, people aren't really focusing on that. 
Um, I think it's important to share what it means about confidentiality. So for example, if I'm gonna to talk to a participant, I might wanna say, the reason we talk about confidentiality is so that other people are not sharing your personal business or information and vice versa. So that people can understand that after support group, when you're having that cigarette outside and under the roof, you're not talking about people's business that you were just in the group with, right? You're not sharing information. You're not sharing it outside the organization. You're not, you're not talking about so-and-so said so-and-so while you're having that cigarette in the parking lot, right? So understanding gossip versus confidentiality and making sure that people understand what that means. I think that's really important. Um, similarly, this is another conversation to have with your team. Um, there's not one right answer and we're not gonna be able to answer that for you, but we do hear um, a lot of questions about does someone stay in support group forever? What's a good time frame for that? Put some things down here for you to consider. Um, you know, if the goal is to get that person's support and have them tell their story, you know, after five years, is it helpful for them to, you know, be hearing uh, stories of folks who have just left relationships or who are currently experiencing a lot of violence? Um, and so these are just, things to think about and, you know, whether there are ways that you could provide or encourage opportunities for survivors who have been in group for a while to maybe lead their own groups or provide support in their community. Um, and, you know, asking someone to leave is kind of a, a not, not completely related to this, um, but we, you know, the, the check-ins that we mentioned earlier, I think setting those up can be a good way to make sure that you're already um, having those conversations. And if this is something that you feel like you need um, more support around, we, we'd be happy to chat about some things to consider. I think definitely because, you know, our organizations, our support groups sometimes aren't for everyone. And sometimes as we move along, we recognize that what we provide and what they need are no longer a match anymore. So making sure that the participant and the organization and what we provide are still matching up is really important. Um, and so, I think that's the whole point on continuing to have one-on-ones with folks to make sure you're still sort of providing that support along with the lines of what they need. Um, and then I think, you know, I've always thought about this is like why if people have been with us for quite some time, you know, are folks ready to um, provide a support group on their own? Could we set someone up who's been doing support group for years um, who we think could possibly lead? Could we help them do that within their own community? Why or why not? I think it's a great question to ask. Um, if some folks are ready for that, I think that's a game changer. Um, if we're really helping folks um, help others in their community. Um, so it's just something to think about. I've thought about it before and I've often heard people say, I don't have any resources in my, in my neighborhood or in my building. Like people live in big apartment complexes where there's, you know, 200 units and just imagine how many people in those units are probably experiencing DV. And it would be great to know if there was someone in that unit or that, that area that knew where they could go for resources and they didn't have to go far. So sometimes I think we can te teach one, teach another, teach another, um, and it can be provided within people's, within, within everyone's community. So it's something to think about as a group, as you talk with your coworkers, what that could look like. I know we're still in COVID, so it could be something down the road, but thinking about how could our, how could our, how could our participants who have been with us for a long time um, be useful to others? Okay, so we have a little time here to talk about specifically virtual support groups. Um, so you don't have to put this in the chat. You can also unmute. Um, but if you wanna share a little bit about how you adapted your support groups during the pandemic, how has that gone? Are you still doing a virtual support group? Was that an option that people liked? Or is it something that you might keep doing even if you do go back to some in-person groups? So um, we'd just love to, to hear from folks.
I know some folks have um, said that they were doing support groups virtually during the pandemic and it seemed to be going well. Yes, Amy, you can unmute. Um, yeah, so I'm from the Family Justice Center in Pierce County. Um, I actually came on board here during COVID and oh. they had stopped their um, support groups while they were deciding how to do it. And so I was brought on board to, and part of the coming on board was the expectation that I would be doing groups um, because I've done them before. And um, we started up with Zoom. So we do a Zoom link, but we make sure that the confidentiality agreement is signed before people receive that um, so that it's still understood that it needs to be confidential and I screen beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems to be working. We're on uh, our fourth round and now um, it's a closed group. So um, it, we don't have any plans to transition back into person uh, in person yet, but we are still always looking and reviewing the pros and cons because we have our limited staff to be able to do that if we were to look at maybe two or hybrid or staying. So we're still in communication about that, but currently um, it's working out really well for people and we do it over a lunch hour. So people are able to, if they're working even from home, mm -hmm. can still join. Mm -hmm. How many people do you generally have show up for your support group? Between five and eight. That's good. Awesome. Um, so I have a wait list going. Um, and so the wait list, I usually take, um, like the people I invite, I invite up to 12 at a time, mm -hmm. knowing that anywhere from 50 to 80% generally show. Right. Um, so, well, you know, hopefully there's 10, right? But generally it's been between five and eight. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate Thank that. You. Yeah. I, I also started with my organization uh, when COVID was in full effect. And um, they had, uh, I think from a total of four in-person groups, four or five, uh, uh, we were down to one virtual support group. Now we have two virtual support groups. Uh, so we're holding group twice a week um, and it is an open group. So we work on a 12 week curriculum. It's over Zoom. Um, and the curriculum I look at as a supported, a facilitated conversation, right? So I use it as a guideline, uh, what we're gonna talk about, but for that week, but there's a lot of room for peer support and for back and forth and for share out, outs. And as we've been working you know, on Zoom, we've been able to use some of the features to make it much more interactive. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, it doesn't solve the problem, but the childcare issue is workable on mm -hmm. Zoom because I, I mean, we have guidelines, we have agreements, we have Zoom etiquette, right? That we reiterate every session. Um, always leaving time for people to share any modifications or anything they need. We have people report out about their access needs. So for example, if somebody's breastfeeding, they'll say, you know, I've got an infant. I may have my camera off, people making dinner, listening on headphones. In a way, it allows people much more access. And when I'm doing intakes, you know, I can offer them one of two nights and then they can sit in their cars if they need to. Mm -hmm. They can participate when they're houseless. I mean, we have, um, it, it really has widened, in my opinion, the access. Um, and the participants can uh, join the group at any time because once we finish week 12, we just cycle back to week one. So mm -hmm. they'll pick up those sessions and then they can participate three full times through the curriculum. And then they move to, uh, they're invited to a group called uh, Insights and Beyond. We call our groups Insight Support Groups. Mm -hmm. And Insight and Beyond is for people a little bit farther along on their healing journey, dealing with, again, um, healthy boundaries, how to date after IPV, things like that. Um, and that group will come back in person in the spring. And that one we're right now developing the scope of the group and the curriculum because we're going to be involving a lot more um, arts-based activities with that group because it's a much broader 
sort of range, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and as far as security, I mean, besides our secure Zoom link, which is in some way more secure than regular link, which Zoom links, which I can't speak to, but somebody in the organization can. We do, um, once I complete the intake and talk to them about the nature of group and what happens, uh, I send them a release of information form that then they return. And that's the way I'm able to send them the secure link. Mm -hmm. And that automatically expires every three months and has to be redone. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then as far as attendance, uh, the original group was Wednesdays virtually, and that is routinely 12 or more people. And then the group that we added pretty recently, at the beginning of January, uh, that's got from four to six, depending on, on uh, the nature of the day. A few less yesterday because it was Valentine's Day. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, Beth. Thank you for sharing that. Um, can I say that if people are interested in knowing more about how you do that, maybe they can uh, message you directly in the chat and ask you for your email and maybe they can contact you. Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, thanks. I mean, that was kind of an information dump, yeah. you yeah. know what I mean? But a lot of what we're doing feels like it's working. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd love to share. Yeah. I think that would be great. Amy too, like if if you think you've heard something great, you can direct message um, yes, after absolutely. Amy and ask them questions, get their email um, and connect with them. I think, again, that's one of the things why we're here. If you hear something good or you see something good in chat, you can direct message that person to ask, can you have more conversations? So um, definitely feel free to reach out to, to folks here on this Zoom call. I, I do, um, Sojourner, um, She's my boss. <laughs> okay, wrote, uh, we use Zoom Healthcare. Can you tell us what Zoom Healthcare is? Yeah, hi, uh, can you hear me? I have yeah. headphones on. Okay, perfect. Um, so regular Zoom only gives you like 40 minute time slots and it has, I'm not sure on like the specifics, we have an operations manager here that does a lot of our IT stuff. Um, and they did some vetting on Zoom Healthcare where it has some additional protections um, in terms of confidentiality and it's used for like telehealth and that kind of stuff. Um, so it is in line with like HIPAA regulations. Um, and it also allows us to have longer appointment times. So we can go, you know, a couple of hours. What we have, you know, more flexibility in how we can schedule and we can have, which we don't use, but you can have 300 participants at one time um, where we do like a, a biannual training. Um, and so that's what we use for that, but we, it has the capacity to hold more and it also doesn't report back any information to Zoom or catalog some other things that may happen with a typical Zoom account. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's important yeah. to know. I will say though that we pay for the subscription. Mm -hmm. um, just to throw that out there, we do pay for Zoom healthcare. So it really depends on whether or not your agency, you know, has some flexible funding to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, if there are other folks that want to share, we they still can. I just wanted to um, shift to a couple of the things I feel like you all pretty much spoke to these. Um, there is the issue of security and internet access that's on the survivor's end for sure. So needing to have those conversations with an individual um, survivor about figuring out what's gonna work for them. Um, and I, so I haven't got, we haven't gotten to sharing this yet, but I did make a Dropbox. And in there we have shared um, one example that we got of some virtual support group guidelines and um, like a informed consent. And in that it talks about some of the confidentiality requirements, including um, ensuring that they're in a private space or that no one else is hearing what's being said and also not to take screenshots and photos and things like that. Um, and you know, when in doubt, being explicit about what you, what's not okay. Um, with people is is the way to go um, and will make everyone else in the group feel safe safer as well right um, yeah so you'll be able to access those those examples if your program hasn't put those together yet and it sounds like beth also mentioned some um, documents that they have that they share with um, folks or virtual group as well Okay. 
All right, so moving into facilitation skills. We're gonna, we're gonna speed up here because we know we only have a few minutes left, so. Oh yeah, I mean, it's very clear to me that we can have much more conversation about this, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so um, these, we're, not gonna, we're definitely not gonna thoroughly be able to dive into these facilitation basics and maybe this is a whole separate webinar in and of itself, but um, these, are some of the core pieces that really stood out to me um, as things that would be important for group. So the one that I'm gonna talk about a little bit is setting the environment and holding the structure um, because that is definitely something that falls squarely into your role as an advocate and a support group facilitator. Um, we got a question that I thought was really sweet about rituals for ending and starting group. Um, so if there are things that you do, um, we'll take a little minute um, for folks to, to share those. Um, but that is exactly what you can do as, as the facilitator, right? Is you get to set up the container for groups. So um, there was a group that I facilitated where at the beginning every week, we had a bowl of rocks and everybody took a rock and we did like a breathing exercise with that grounding rock. And we said something about, you know, how these rocks were used um, with survivors from the group for years. And then sometimes people who were in the support group wanted to like take one with them to like a court hearing that week and bring it back and feel like um, that person was with them. And, you know, I think ultimately we figured out like COVID would not be spread through touching rocks, but you know, COVID might complicate that, um, that plan, but you know, just something, it's just an example, right? Um, and closing out group maybe with, um, you know, whether that is closing out with a thought that some people are going to take with them or having another quiet moment or some type of activity. I think that those little things actually really do end up being, um, you know, pieces that someone's relying on, or we always take our break at this time, or actually we have tea at the beginning of group that people um, like to make or whatever it is, like those little pieces, what I've learned is like people come to look forward to them and that is part of like what they know is gonna be there and um, can be a really sweet part of group. I, I totally agree with you, Heather. I think the piece on here for me really is about managing a crisis. And I think, um, first of all, identifying what we really consider to be a crisis, because everything can be a crisis to like, there wasn't popcorn to serve to, you know, the door, the bathroom, you know, we don't have toilet paper to, um, you know, someone shows up intoxicated. So just defining what really a crisis is, and also knowing like, you actually can manage a lot of things and, and multitask as, as, as an advocate, because that's who we are, um, and really understanding and defining what is a crisis and what um, that looks like to you, and then having a plan B. So what's your plan B? Do you have someone else that's in the building with you? Is it just you by yourself? Do you have a cell phone with you? Do you have the person that you need to call in case a crisis happens and they can show up within five minutes? Like what, what does it look like for you? What is your plan B? So just remember you, if you're by yourself, you got to have a plan B um, and, and, and everything isn't a crisis. It might feel like a crisis, but the reality is it probably isn't. Um, I don't know. I don't like blood. So if someone lost a tooth, that would be a crisis for me because I would probably pass out and then I'd be useless, but um, maybe you'd be able to be just fine. So you have to figure out like what's your limit and what you can do and what you can't do um, and always have plan B. Yeah, I'm thinking about conflict resolution. Um, it also just brought to mind how beneficial it can be to have another person there with you, um, not just to navigate that conflict in the moment, but if it escalates to a point where the group might need to take a break or those um, an individual or individuals involved might need to have someone check in with them one on one. Um, that would be a really helpful, helpful time um, to to have that happen. Um, and you know, just remember that as as the facilitator, like you can make a call in the moment. You can pause. Um, you can de-escalate the situation by not getting um, caught up in it yourself. Um, or, you know, trying to say who's right or wrong, um, all those sorts of things that um, 
we know from doing one-on-one -on -one advocacy um, can really be be grounding and de-escalating. And um, you know, with the with the two with the separating or having a separate conversation with someone, like sometimes someone feels like they need to be heard, and that's often a great way to de-escalate that. And it might not be able to happen right in the moment, but um, if if there's a conflict, but um, being able to to do some follow up and repair, um, you know, that's that's all part of doing support group. And we're all pretty strong, resilient folks. So even the folks that are in your group, um, if something happens, most of the time people just jump into action and know what to do. So if people are also given um, this, the information, what's in the room, what's provided to them, safety measures, like if anything happens, most people who are in your support group will probably just jump into action and be able to maybe even resolve a conflict that might be happening or manage a crisis that's happening. So oftentimes the, the model that we set going into the process, people pick up on, even though they're there to, to share who they are, um, quickly they can jump in if needed. We're human. Yes, and um, I see a question about um, support groups in multiple languages. Um, yeah, you can have interpreters in your group. Um, you know, if you're having group in person, I think given the nature of it, it would be ideal to have it be the same interpreter. And so being able to find that entrusted interpreter and talk to them about group and what that's gonna be like um, and have it be that same person every time. Um, but, you know, with it, with it being on Zoom or, or other options, you know, um, just being able to make sure that um, folks have access to group um, in their language is really important. And so I think that's where you really need to rely on that. And then also if, if, if that person's language is part of, um, you know, a larger cultural community in your area and you want to um, see if there are other groups that are held in that language, um, you know, that could be a good fit. And I also know um, from talking about doing culturally specific work in queer and trans communities, sometimes people specifically don't want to go to the queer support group because they know all the people there and they want to go to the, the other support group where like there aren't all their people there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, giving people options and then, the, and then also really being committed to making sure they can access your your group, I think is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I was just gonna say, I wanna make sure that we get to um, some of the curriculum stuff to share. Um, yes. So specialized support groups, culturally specific, I think you kind of were already talking about this just a second ago. Um, culturally specific support groups, parenting, uh, Spanish speaking support groups. I know that we dealt those at um, New Beginnings. Um, and it's real important to, I mean, I think we should all be thinking about that. How do we provide specialized groups to, to folks? Like, what does that look like? Again, I said, planning is key. You got to plan, you got to talk about it. You can't just start it next week. You actually got to think it through. Um, older adult survivors. I remember, at, you know, Sarah Parker. I'm, I don't know if anyone knows Sarah Parker from New Beginnings. She was a great advocate who obviously started a support group and noticed that a, a large number of the, her participants in this one group were at least 55, 60 and above. Um, and so we recognized that as like this older group. And so we just kind of kept it going that way. And that's who wanted to go to that group. Um, so it was, it was a, it was a beautiful time. It worked out well and it was, it was awesome. So just figuring out the needs of the folks who are coming to your organization. Sometimes you might want to create that space for folks. Um, chemical dependency and substance. We had a CD group. Um, we had someone specifically doing that group for us. It, it, it was phenomenal. Um, we had several groups a week. So there was probably like maybe six to eight groups a week at a time. So they hit on different particular topics. Um, support groups in jail. I know some folks are probably already doing that. Um, so I, we, we can hear from you if you want to put something in the chat, but there are specialized groups that are happening. They are successful. People are doing them. They do take planning. They do take prep work um, and being considerate, but considerate about the group that you are focusing on. Um, ask them, don't assume. I would add to this, specialized support groups are always a good time to look at partnerships you can develop with other 
agencies or resources in the area, especially with things like chemical dependency, looking at um, who are some of those chemical dependency providers in the area and, you know, mm -hmm. sorting through kind of the difference in values and ethics that some of those providers might have, but looking at where you can do resource sharing, or if you're doing an LGBTQ specific group, maybe there is like a, a queer led organization in the local area that you can partner up with. Uh, to prevent reinventing the wheel, because so many of these conversations are already happening in communities. So, you know, where can you take off some of that thinking process because it's already been thought of and just partner up and see how you can really develop something unique and collaborative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Mary mentioned that she was doing a group in jail and it ended because of COVID. And just to know, like, you know, we're in this, as soon as we get it all down, our world is going to change again and all the doors are going to open. They're going to be like, ah, no more masks, right? So just so we're, we're, we're in a process of trying to figure it all out because of COVID and then who knows, the gates will open and things will change. So just keep pushing, keep trying and keep doing new things. Other ways to talk about support groups, women's groups, um, community events. I think Heather, this was something that you wanted to talk about. Was that, am I right? Yeah, I just wanted to name that, like, you can call your group whatever you want to call your group. It can have a covert name. It can, you know, um, obviously not all of our, in our groups aren't only for women, but, you know, there are different ways that people might refer to their group. Um, it could be a sewing group or a cooking group, and that might be because that is a better fit for that cultural community, or, you know, it could just be sort of like what participants are calling it by default, um, and so just wanted to name that, um, that those are things that we see in support groups, and that is all great as well, and something that you might want to think about um, if you're having recruitment issues, or you just want to rethink through your recruitment, like, how are you going to talk about your group? Um, in a way that people who might not totally identify as survivors yet, um, but are actually needing that support, how they might be thinking about their experience. And one quick thing I'll just say is, you can keep that slide there, is um, a, a lot of our um, participants are still with their partners and they can't, and some can't go to groups. Um, and just thinking about ways to get information to some of our folks who are still in their relationships. So I know one program would do a summer event um, and collaborate with health organizations and fruit stands and different places. And they would do this whole group thing in a park where people could come with their partners and their children and get resources and information about health, heart, um, heart information, diabetes, all of those things all in one so that they could still get the information they needed um, without outing themselves, knowing that it came from um, the domestic violence program in their community. Right, what are, what are ways that you're gonna connect with people in a broader way? Yeah, and I think I would just add that I, it was important for us to have this conversation because so many people were asking about it. And during the process, we realized that we're, we're all doing, we're all doing it right. You know, whether we have less materials or more materials, it doesn't matter. Listening is so important. Providing the space is so important. Um, and just being able to be there for survivors is really, really what most folks really just want. And, and I, I think Heather said this, there's no right or wrong. It's just like how we can um, provide a space for survivors to come to, to be able to share what, they're experiencing is so important. Um, and we can keep talking about this because we're always doing different things, new things, challenging things. And just sharing, I think is so important. And that's why I thought just bringing us all together is the important part of this so that we could connect. And thank you, Heather, for putting that um, link in there. Yeah, of course, I'll make sure that it gets um, shared out in the um, certificate as well. Yes, Beth said, this is helpful. Love to have another session. I know this could go on and on. Like we, we definitely could talk about this so much more. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with this. I hope this was um, helpful. I hope that you guys have some takeaways.